How's everyone today? I'm interactive. You're going to have to bear with me. It's what I do. Plus, it's early. We got to get our blood pumping. This is an amazing event. This is an amazing day. Arlinda, thank you so much for having us. We always appreciate the fact that you integrate this part of the business. You're always about your business, but in making sure that the attorneys and the legal foundation that these people need to know about is covered is what we love. So we are grateful to you because everyone doesn't understand that significance, but y'all do. That's why you're here, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> so my name is Heather Beverly. This is the legal panel um, to kick off your morning and your day. I know there's amazing things to come. I am so, so happy to have this esteemed group of attorneys joining me on the stage this morning. I know that we're starting a little bit tardy, uh, so as Arlinda said, forgive us. But we're gonna do, guys, is that, you know, this conference this year, the, the topic is all about kind of monetizing in a digital age and how to get your money and how to handle your business in a digital age. Well, from our perspective, because you know we huddled up before this thing and talked a little bit, from our perspective, in order to get to the money, we understand that you have to have a foundation and you have to understand the business and you sort of have to have a lot of legal things in place so that the foundation is strong and you can get your money. Because as you're gonna find out today, there's a lot of parts of this thing in this business that if you don't have the business right, even if what you've done and even if what you've created makes money, you won't. So. What I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to, I was gonna read everyone's bio and give you all of that. I want you guys to know that everyone up here is absolutely at the top of this field. These are incredible people. I'm going to make them introduce themselves because I don't think that we speak about ourselves enough and they're probably still gonna be brief and all of that and I'm probably gonna have to say some more. But um, I do want everyone to kind of introduce themselves um, and tell you a little bit about what they do and then we'll get into the subjects that we've got prepped for you. So if we, let's start on the, William, would you like to go ahead? You go first. Okay, good morning again. Uh, my name is William Ashbourne. I'm an attorney and a professor of law. I'm currently teaching at Alabama State University. Uh, my background goes way back to a little girl named Roxanne Chante. I started with the Juice Crew in New York City. I'm from the Bronx. Um, so chilling, yes sir. That's right. Um, so I have a wealth of experience that I would love to share with you. Unfortunately, or fortunately, however you look at it, we only have a very limited amount of time. So I will be roaming around. Please make, make yourself known to me. If you have questions that I don't get to get to at the end of this, Please make yourselves known to me. I'm here for you. We came out here, none of us are being paid to do this. This is for the love of you guys to make sure you guys get it together and don't make silly mistakes and then come to us. Normally that's when we see you after you sign that deal, after you, I call them sharecropper deals, <laughs> after you sign that sharecropper deal and then you realize everybody's making money but you. Please come to us, talk to us, get to know us. Like I said, we're here for you. Thank you. Thank you. James? Good morning, Heather. And thank you to Ms. Garrett and MBE Conference for having me. My name is James Walker, originally from Connecticut. I've been in Atlanta about 10 years now. Uh, as most of us are, I do entertainment law. I do litigation as well. And um, background went to Howard, went to Yale, uh, taught entertainment law for years, um, represented everybody from Shirley Caesar to DMX and everything in between. Um, and just having fun. My zeal as a lawyer, or zealousness is to try to protect the artists, particularly the African American artists, make sure they get their due, make sure they understand what they're signing, and make sure that they have an estate set up for them, their kids, their grandkids, and their great grandkids, and so on and so on, that they think this thing out. There's a lot of money in the music business and the artists generate the majority of the money, but unfortunately a small group of people usually benefit from those billions of dollars because we sometimes can't get our artists to really read what they're signing and understand the business of music. 
Somebody said to me yesterday, like, remember, it's show business, it's music business, but business is the bigger word. Somebody told me that yesterday to remind me. I put together a handout. If you didn't get it, let me know. I'll talk a little bit from it later. Um, actually, my staff put it together. I'm seeing it for the first time this morning, so I got to confess. I we know you have people staff. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good job. No typos, thank God. We made it through that realm, if y'all know what I'm talking about as attorneys. But anyway, um, I want you to look at it because I put 10 things on it that are very important from copyright to estate planning to digital contracts. And I'm honored to be here. I'll be here all day to answer your questions. Thank you, James. Now, what he also did not tell you is that he's also an author. He has a book about the music business and it's phenomenal. So is that on your handout? Will you tell them your, about your book and where they can get it? Okay. Omara. Hello, um, sorry, I'm getting over the flu and a cold, so. Um, but I am from Henderson, North Carolina. I went to Spelman College undergrad, North Carolina Central University School of Law for law school. I've been practicing um, in Atlanta for about 16 years. I do a lot of music, a lot of television, a lot of music-related television. So I can also help out with any of those questions if you guys are interested in either putting your music on television or you're interested in a reality show. I've done many reality shows related to music from Kay Michelle, My Life, to um, Gosh, it's so many. Up to Braxton Family Values, um, to Married to Medicine, which is not necessarily as music related, but Candy Factory. It's um, one of those things where I kind of just merged into the music related television stuff, just coincidentally, where, with the influx of reality television coming into Atlanta. I had a lot of clients that ended up being talent on shows. Um, and ended up being pretty successful doing so. And so we've had a lot of success in the reality realm. On the music front, um, I've represented producers and artists all across. I mean, they, I won't even go down some of the list of the people because I feel like everybody has up here has represented a lot of really good um, artists and producers. But I'm just here to answer any questions and to hopefully help you guys out with any you know, provisions that you don't understand, that you see regularly in contracts, or things that you come across on a daily basis, things that you don't kind of understand in the digital realm as it pertains to television and music, um, or music-related television, and I'm just hoping to be a resource. Thank you so much. Ursula? Hi, I'm Ursula Lankford. I, am, I went to University of Georgia. I graduated from law school from Michigan State. I am from Atlanta, Georgia, East Side, Decatur. Yes, I am. Big town. Big town. <laughs> um, I primarily work with, um, well, I do music and, tele music and television and film. Um, I, my background is a little different. I actually started um, in radio as a promotions director and manager out in Dallas, Texas. So I've come with a kind of a slightly different perspective because I know the artist side of it. I know the working with no budget side of it and trying to, so I come with a different creative side of it because I've, I've been there and I've seen it and I've had to work with no budgets working in radio. Um, I do a lot of contract negotiations. I don't do litigation, so James, I can give you those. Um, <laughs> I don't do litigation. I do a lot of trademark law, copyright, like I said, negotiations. I am, I consider myself a teaching attorney, meaning that I can do your contract, but I would rather teach you as we go along, help you to learn the business, help you to learn to read a contract, interpret it. Now, you may not get to the point, like all of us on this stage, where we can dissect one and spit it back out, but that you're able to read and understand and follow along. But I like to teach my, um, my clients and the people that I come across what we're doing. I'm here to answer any questions um, in television. Um, I've worked with a lot of actors and actresses, putting them on television, finding them deals, working the deals, um, just trying to get into the whole music for um, synchronization and putting it on television. I'm trying to segue over to that because a lot of my artists are now, I'm trying to teach them different streams of revenue and get them accustomed to doing something differently than what was um, normally done. So that's me. They have a plethora of information. I'm Heather Beverly. I have a law firm called the Law Office of Heather Beverly. I too am an entertainment attorney, been practicing about 21 years or more or so-ish. 
Um, my practice, too, like theirs, um, is kind of rooted in music, television, film. I've got a lot of clients that range from artists, writers, producers, to labels and entities and companies. Um, and just as broad a range as everyone here, too, from the gospel industry, from like the Hezekiah Walkers of the world to hip hop. I have a producer that did a couple of the biggest songs last year, Taste by Tyga and ZZ by Kodak Black and others, Chris Brown, blah, blah, blah. Some pop producers and writers, um, and then companies like Music World, which is Matthew Knowles' uh, company and all of his entities, Destiny's Child brand and so forth. So uh, hopefully I'll be able to guide you all because I do a little bit of this too. Um, before we start more, I'd like to know who we're talking to and I think they do too. So how many people in the room are artists or on the creative side, artists, writers, producers? Oh good, about half of you, wonderful. So glad you're here. What about on the management side? Y'all running things and telling everybody what to get to get up, get it together, yes, wonderful. And any labels, production companies? Uh, yeah, good, okay. Who'd I miss? Someone is going, uh, well, you forgot what I do. TV, film, we are in the A, come on. Okay, wonderful. Well, just so you know, all of you really are probably all of those things in a little bit and everyone probably could have raised their hands to all of it in some way or another because if you're talent, maybe you're making the music but maybe your music is ending up in a film or on a television show or in a commercial or something. Um, and even if you are management, you've got to know what your talent can do. And even though you may not do it yourself, you are rooted in, invested in what they do. So again, today is about the, bu the business and the fundamentals of how to get to the money that you want to get to. Um, sort of want to talk about you as a business, right? So I, we know now that there's kind of a myriad of people in the room um, but at the end of the day, whether you think you're an artist looking for a, a deal or putting out your own record or a manager or a label, you are a business. And so I wanted someone to begin by kind of talking to us, you know, if you are the label, because that is changing now in this digital age, or if you are an artist and you're putting out your own content, who is, like, who, what really is a label anymore? Um, from the majors to the indies, and why should these people each individually be thinking of themselves as a business, or in what way should be they be thinking about themselves as a business? And I think that, Omara, you wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the you as a business. Um, okay, so I think um, the best place to kind of start, since there's a lot of artists in the room, we always talk about this, and I have, it, it's such a, a new conversation, but a reoccurring conversation. Still bringing in some of that major funding and the major opportunities, but keep my cut. Because once you sign up for a major deal, clearly everybody knows your numbers go way down, um, and it can run the gap, which it doesn't have to. You know, I have a client who has a label deal, and he splits everything with his, um, he has a label deal with a major, Sony, so he splits everything 50-50 with his clients that he makes, and he has a 50-50 deal. So the client ends up getting a decent percentage that's way higher than a normal person in a major distribution deal. So that's another thing to consider if you're signing to someone who's already in a label deal, what type of deal do they have? Because, you know, you want to be able to also take advantage of all of the different deal structures that might benefit you as an artist that you may not necessarily think about when you're just trying to get signed and you're wondering when your single's coming out and you're creative and videos and this, that, and the other. You know, a lot of times the artists will be focused on things like, well, how much is my video budget gonna be in? You know, how many videos do I get? And it's like, yeah, I get that there's a promotional element that you wanna make sure is there, but I think we all know that at this point, videos are not the preeminent form of marketing, which at one point, it was one of the most premier forms of marketing, you know, back in the BET, what's it, 106 and Park, and MTV, all of those big, TRL, all those big shows where videos were everything, every day at four or five o'clock, you know, to get your video played on these major platforms. Um, like I said, I also do a lot of stuff with television, 
So you can also um, think about a structure where you're trying to ne not necessarily sign to a label, but maybe kind of wiggle into the music business via television, via reality television. Um, I have a lot of clients on Growing Up Hip Hop Atlanta, um, Love and Hip Hop in New York, Love and Hip Hop uh, Hollywood, Love and Hip Hop Atlanta, um, all the Love and Hip Hop franchises basically. <laughs> and you know, I think a lot of them are doing it, you know, they say, oh, well, you know, these franchises are very, you know, brand tumultuous, where, you know, you can get on there and it can go amazing or it can go awry, you know, depending on how you behave, what type of altercations you might get into with other artists or other producers on the show. But I think um, you just kind of have to be in your, in, aware of who you are in all of these situations. And I tell my clients that all the time, you know. Awesome. So as you hear, you as a business, whether you're the artist or you are going to put something out independently or whether you're the management company or the label, you actually have a bunch of options and different considerations. James, when I'm starting my career and regardless of what role I'm playing, I kind of know that the point of this thing is that I want to make money and I want to be a business. Where do the lawyers, where do we come into play? when it comes to us actually being a business? I think the lawyers come into play right at the beginning, um, Heather. I think a lot of times people make the mistake of going in the studio with their boy or their girl and they're laying down songs and laying down tracks. No one's talking to a lawyer, no one's discussing copyright or trademark or splits or anything of that nature. And then something takes off and then I get the litigation call. You know that record, Work It Out by Meagles, that's my record. I was working on this, I was working on that. And now we got to try to backtrack and recreate, OK, what happened that night in the studio? What hook did you write? What line did you write? Did you do the chords? Did you do the music? Did you do the bars? Did you do this? Did you do that? When if you have a lawyer involved from day one, or at least early on, maybe not day one, but early on, you can at least lay out what the splits are, um, what the partnership is going to be, whether it's going to be an LLC. You see on my list, I think number nine, I say setting up the LLC or setting up the corporation, you can decide right then and there. And for those of you who are production companies, I think my brother on the front said he was production company. Just remember, if you're doing business as James Walker Records, and you're not set up as any kind of corporate entity, if something goes wrong in that studio, they're suing you, James Walker, the person. So I always stress to the guys that are running these studios, particularly now where we're having shootings in studios and we're having all kinds of different things going on, I always tell my clients, let's go ahead and incorporate it. LLC, corporation, partnership, whatever, so that we can shield you from liability. We don't want anybody to come to the studio or anything to go down, and they're trying to, what we say, pierce the veil and come right to you directly and sue you directly. So to answer your question, Heather, I think it's good to get a lawyer in early on, even if it's just paid $100, $200. It strikes me odd that artists will pay three, four, five hundred $500 for sneakers and clothes and hair, I always say that. hair and all of that. Then they call my office and Cherise says, well, it's $200 to sit down with him. We'll cut his rate in half. You can come sit down for $200. And they go, oh my God, it's $200 to sit down? And I say, well, when you go to the doctor or the dentist, you're paying the same thing. But you're putting all this money into making a CD or a record, and you don't want to spend that one hour of time hiring one of these qualified people on this panel to set you up for the next 10, 15, 20 years. It's the best hourly consultation you can uh, engage. So do that initial conversation so you know where to go. It's the best money you could spend. Awesome. Heather, can I interject? You may, of course. I, I want to add to that is that when you, in the initial stages, I'm a different, probably, I don't know if you guys do it, but I like to sit down with potential clients and artists and whomever, and sometimes if I take you on as a client, I want to know where you're going, what you want to do, because I can help you map it out. I can say, okay, here's where, where we're going to go. And also, okay, you need an accountant. Okay. Cause we're going to pay those taxes and we're going to make sure everybody's get paid, gets paid properly. So in those initial conversations, if you're looking at an attorney and you want a specific attorney, you want to work with that attorney, sit with that attorney and say, this is my goal for what I want to do with my career. I might say, this is great, but Hey, have you thought about synchronization? Have you thought about uh, maybe getting on a television show? Have you thought about diff acting? I mean, sometimes the attorney will give you a different perspective on something that you're doing to help you monetize and help you grow your business. So don't feel like we're just all about the paperwork. Some of us are here and we can actually help you brand, market, and move your project along, okay? That's yeah. everything. 
Yeah, I have several clients, especially my clients who are bigger companies, who won't even refer to me as their attorney, they refer to me as their legal affairs or their business affairs department. And so we're on calls, if they're just taking their first calls about a project they're thinking about developing or an artist they're thinking about taking on or how they're gonna go about building or expanding their business and brands, I'm on those calls because A, just like Ursula said and like James said, we're there to advise and counsel you, but also to get the information. I think everyone here has had that moment where we start out representing you, maybe we've helped you set up your company, and then it's a year later and we get some call of something, just mayhem has occurred. And we're like, why are we just now getting this call? What, all that has happened and you didn't let us know? And by the way, just like, Mike, just like William said earlier, you know, we're, we're, we do this to educate you for free. But one of my favorite phrases is pay us now or pay us more later. Because if you wait for the problem to grow and be bigger, it's actually more expensive to deal with an emergency than it is to be proactive and help you avoid them. And Heather, can I chime in one Please. last thing? Excuse me, Ms. Ashburn. Um, I always tell clients, anyone can do your contract, but make sure, and I shouldn't say anyone, I'm being general, but a lot of attorneys can do your contract, but make sure it's the attorney that's a good fit for you and just because he's representing Jay-Z or she's representing Beyonce doesn't necessarily mean they're good for you. Make sure you kind of really, really listen to your gut instincts and do your homework and make sure it's a good fit. I always tell clients that. So I just want to put that out there as we talk about hiring the lawyer. Yeah, everything ain't for everybody. All right, so now we're a business. We've got our lawyers on tap. We know what we're doing. We're getting our plan together. But now we're really about to get into, let's start making some music, or let's make a TV show, or let's make a project. We're gonna do something that's gonna hopefully make us some money, right? Family, we still here? Yeah. Yes, okay, good. So one of the things that I always love to start talking with people about when they're talking about making money in the music business is what is really kind of one of the fundamental basics? And you guys have probably heard the word copyright, and you've probably heard about publishing, and money is in copyright, and money is in publishing, but you may not, or you might, but you may not exactly know what does that mean. And I'm gonna let, I'm gonna have, um, William's gonna start, and I'm gonna also have Ursula talk to you about some of these things about copyright and what they are and where some of this money is made from them. And before you guys start, though, let me ask a question. Who in this room has ever had a job? I mean, not everybody has had a job. Okay, so whether it was McDonald's or whether it was CEO of Fill in the Blank Inc., when you went and you applied for the job, did you ask what you were going to get paid? Yeah, yeah. Before you accepted the job, did you know like what day you were going to get paid? Like every other Friday, every, yes. And then you probably knew like, oh, if I could withholdings and some taxes might come out and all that, right? Okay, is there anyone in here who has ever accepted a job where they went, interviewed, and started day one and did not know how they were getting paid? Okay, now all of you said you're in the music business from artists to owners of companies. It always surprises us how many of you, yes, I'm talking to you, don't know how in the, how <laughs> you they know I kind of I can yeah, I wanna I wanna I wanna yeah. how you get paid and where does this money come from and if you don't know what a copyright is which is the whole point of it all there's a song I'm not Anthony Hamilton so I won't sing the point of it all but the point of it all is to get paid so let's we'll start with you professor first of all could you just tell them what a copyright is. Yeah, you know, we do assume, I know I have been in the business a long time, and we do assume that people understand copyright. But it is so amazing to me that how many people will get into this business and not have a clue of what it is. Oh, can I stand up? I don't you can. Thank no, you. Thank you. Because I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm used to yelling hands on them. Because this is Some of so, us got cute shoes on. We're not trying to be standing This is so basic, <laughs> but it is so important. I have people come to me and say, oh, well, it's, it's not been copyrighted. And I'm like, what do you mean it's not been copyrighted? They say, oh, well, I haven't mailed it to myself and kept the envelope. <laughs> Come on, postage stamp. Um, let me just tell you, there is no provision in the law 
that allows you to mail something to yourself and it now it stands up in the courtroom as a registered copyright. Copyright is not a thing, it's a right. It's like if you bought a house, you have rights to that property. If you own a car, you have rights to that property. When you write a song, you have rights to that song. But you must understand that those rights can only be enforced, and this is new law, just this year, case, can only be enforced if you've registered that copyright with the Library of Congress. So the first thing you do when you leave the studio, like James said, is you do your split sheets. You determine who owns what percentage of those songs that you just worked on. Don't do it two months later, three months later, after people are telling folks, oh, this is about to blow up. Oh, you got a hit. Because the memories get real foggy. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I didn't do 20%. I did 25%. No, I didn't do 30%. I did 33%. And those, those numbers may not be real important right now. When it's time to register, when it's time to get those checks, those numbers become very important. I can tell you, and I can tell you, those lawyers sitting up here know that folks' memories do get foggy. And all you need is one person to say, oh, well, no, this isn't right. And we're contacting everybody in the industry, letting them know, oh, we got some dispute as to the ownership of this song. No checks can be issued. And this can take years. So it's real simple. Split sheets don't have any particular format. Just everybody kind of sign off. This is the song. This is how much we own. And now we have a basis. But understand, copyright is not a thing. Split sheets. Split sheets. Split sheets. Right as you come out the studio, take your time. Ten minutes. Hey, listen, this is the name of the song. These are the people who are involved. You got 10, you got 20, you got 15. It adds up to 100. It's not heavy duty math. Those of you who are not math majors in here, it's not heavy duty math, but it's so critical. So I just wanted to give you that little basic fundamental understanding of your rights. Copyright is a right, just like you have a right to vote, you have a right to um, get married, you have a right. It's United States Section 17 of the U.S. Code. It's the Copyright Act of 1976. No, we don't expect you to memorize that and go home and read it, yes, we but <laughs> we do expect you to know that it is so important. All of the stuff we're going to talk about, all the publishing, all the merchandising, all these different avenues and streams of income you have are only available to you if you own the copyright. Okay, okay, okay. Um, Here they go, this, lawyers. This, yeah, was, I mean, it's true because that's important. There are, every song has two copyrights. It's gonna get a little more complicated. Two copyrights. One copyright we call a PA, underlying composition. The other copyright we call the ESR, the sound recording. They're owned by different people. They provide you with different rights. So it's important that you know, James is right, that there are two copyrights. When you come out of that studio, that's your PA copyright. That's your underlying composition. You file that immediately with the authors, the composers, the writers. All of you list your names and you submit it to the Library of Congress. Well, I guess you don't have to do it by hand anymore. You can do it online. Copyright.gov. Do it online. Download your track digitally. You know, it's, it's a much more advanced and much quicker process. Then there's the SR copyright, which is owned by the label, called the master. That's the copyright for the master. The label owns that. And the label, I guarantee you, well, if you're your label, maybe not, but when you get to the big labels, they will make sure their stuff is covered. Because the greatest asset you have as a writer is that copyright. That is your bank, that is your money, that is your income, your investment. So you gotta make sure that you take care of that registration. Copyright.gov is real user-friendly. You don't have to be a lawyer to go on there. It has those FQAs, frequent, FAQs, frequently asked questions if you get confused. But as James said, the first step you should have is have you a lawyer. So when you run into these things that are kind of a little confusing, you have somebody you can call on, you can go by and sit down and talk to. I'll give you a story. I was teaching here at a place called Georgia State. Anybody Georgia State folks in there? Okay. 
And I had a young man who was the constant pain in the you know what. Every day after class, he's up in my face. Doc, can you tell me about this? Doc, well, what if we did it this way? Doc, I got a friend who's doing this. This kid was so persistent in learning this business that he got to be like a son to me. He would come by my office, he would meet me after class. This gentleman's name is Christopher Bridges. You know him as Ludacris. You have never, never heard about Ludacris having no problem with his business because he learned the business before he got in the business. So take some time, learn the business, and do better because you won't make those mistakes. Can you, before you sit down, can you also clarify to them if you're a producer the rights that you're giving when you're negotiating those two different copyrights, how those rights are being transferred in a producer agreement with the master rights versus the underlying copyright? When you're a producer, you are the owner of what we call the half of the song because the music makes up 50% of the ownership of the song. The lyrics make up 50% and the music makes up 50%. So people say, I'm not a songwriter, I'm a producer. Yes, you are a songwriter. Half of the song is based on the musical content. And when those songs get transferred to a record company, typically there's some language in there, usually around paragraph five or six, talking about work for hire. Mm -hmm. Work for hire language means that now you have just transferred your ownership to that record company. Yes, master rights. Master rights, that SR copyright we were talking about is now the property of that record company. The biggest assets of a publishing company is its catalog of songs. Publishing company, if you would compare publishing company to a record company income, it would be like comparing a Bentley to a Kia. Okay, so publishing companies are going to be the ones that are going to exploit your copyright, but you have to know that that record company now owns your SR copyright. And typically, it's very difficult. I've known a few cases where people were able to negotiate getting their masters back, but the record companies kind of keep that. That's their asset. Mm -hmm. And you have now turned it over to them. Without having to given the names and everything, you kind of sign this hidden in that language is this work for hire agreement, which means everything you've done while you're under this contract belongs to them. That's so thank you. So, you know, I'm the recap girl. So. <laughs> Out of hold your questions. I know some questions, you. but hold your questions because we got to get out of here yeah. shortly. But please stop me. Stop mm -hmm. me and talk to me. And I'm going to have Ursula talk next about kind of how this money flows from this copyright thing that Professor just spoke to us about. But so you've got this copyright thing you own when you create this song. You make it, it's yours. You want the world to know, you want to be able to protect it, you need to register it. Okay, you register it. If you right now, let's say you're the producer, you're kind of registering your interest in the composition, the music you made, that PA form. You might be, for now, until you have to give it to the label, registering that SR form, because maybe you own that master today, right? So you did your split sheet in the studio, because that said, what part of that copyright do I own? Well, why is that important? because that tells you what part of that dollar you get. Who heard that? Somebody didn't hear when you say what part of that copyright you own, what percentage, that means you've also said what percentage of the what you own. The money? The money. So dollar comes in because your copyright made some money. A dollar comes in. How do we know how to split that up between the writer, the producer, the guy that did the cowbell, the yeah, yeah guy, the guy that did the hook, and the artist? How do we know? Come on, see? So you kind of want to know what you own because you kind of want to know what part of the dollar you're entitled to, yes? Okay. And let me just make one quick Please. point. The copyright attaches at the moment that you put it in a tangible form. So, you know, I have a lot of clients coming to me and say, oh, well, look, we were going to ruin the vibe. I don't care nothing mm. about the vibe. Mm. Yes. There's yes. nothing more I could care that's going to ruin the vibe so, than that conflict and, and you don't get paid. And this is, a lot of people, you know, who do hip hop, you have to think about it. There's a producer. Sometimes in Atlanta, you guys are super talented. You have these amazing producers that have never done anything before. You do this amazing song, then a writer gets on it. Oh, well, I just gave it to the guy, and then he had a writer write on it. 
Okay, well, your copyright attached at the moment you put it in that tangible form. It's not gonna attach way down the road once y'all done added Luda and Gucci and all these other people. It's attaching now. So you need, so to me, it's best to start the splits early. So if I'm the producer, I'm like, okay, well, at this point I own 50%. Well, then you went and brought in a writer. Did I bring in the writer or did you bring in the writer? Because that's gonna affect me as a producer whether or not I'm gonna be willing to quote unquote slide over. And in hip hop you end up, if it's a big person, sometimes sliding over and giving them a percentage of your income. But that's something that is a choice. You don't have to do it. You can hold up splits indefinitely if you're rich and you have plenty of money. <laughs> Ursula. <laughs> so Ursula, to all of these points, We've got our copy, we've got our splits, we've registered it, we've got our lawyers on deck, but now we're, it's time, we're gonna maybe put this thing out where we, it's time to exploit our copyrights. What does that mean? How can we do it? And how do exactly do we get to start getting to this money? Um, there are a lot of ways to get to money, and I, I can find money. And <laughs> but you know, first of all, a lot of people I'm 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 starting to still see that a lot of people don't understand or are not registered with PROs, which is your performing rights organizations, BMI, CSAC, and ASCAP. And y that's how you get your money flowing. So the perform the PROs pay out the performing rights. So those are the songwriters, compositions, and publishing. Okay. So that's all the stuff we've talked about now. So now you're trying to get to your money. Okay. And then there is, and it's amazing how many people don't know about Sound Exchange as long as it's been around. <laughs> Omara's looking at me like, really? And Sound Exchange is the payout for people who own the masters, okay? And I'm t it, let me stop and back up and say this. When you guys are registering with these people, with the splits and all this stuff right here, listen, check up on those things, okay? I've had so many clients come to me and say, I don't think I'm getting all my money. Like, what do Way you late. Way late. I have a so client late. 20 years later yeah. tell me, I don't think I'm getting all my money. I, well, honey, I don't know what you guys agreed to 20 years, old, years ago in the studio, if you agree. Well, I looked and that's not what we agreed on. So be diligent in what you do. It goes back to being a business, okay? When you, you, you're putting your best foot forward, be diligent about your business. I had a client, oh, I don't even wanna say this. Um, say it, <laughs> say it. <sighs> okay. It, it, it bothers me still. But they, he, he registered songs with Sound Exchange. Somehow his brother, who was in the band, went to Sound Exchange, filled out some type of form that says that he actually should be getting half the rights. And when, by the time the family found out, 15 years later, this man had taken over $300,000 that was not his. So we had to immediately jump in, file a claim to stop everybody from getting money at this point. So oh, back to someone, you ain't getting paid. So let's stop this till we figure this out. Um, he's deceased, his estate is still open, so it's a hot mess. It's a mess trying to figure this stuff out. Litigation? Uh-huh. Is it litigation? Yeah, you want it? <laughs> okay, we're sorry. <laughs> you know I'm listening. Yeah, and so it's, it's, it's frustrating. So be diligent about checking behind what is filed and not five years later. I mean, once a year, it's six do it, just do it. Okay, so let me get back on track. What was that? You're talking about the areas that the money comes okay, from. Okay, areas of the money from. So your PROs, we've talked about that. That's how you get your performing rights and then, you're, then you get sound, sound exchange. exchange, okay. So then there are other ways of exploiting yourself. There is my favorite, which is licensing. So many people say, oh, I, you know, um, I, what does that mean? That means you're giving someone the, the right to use your creative material and you get paid for it. It could be television, it could be film, it could be a, a sample, it could be, it could be a plethora of things. Um, it could be a, a hotline. And this, to me, and this is another thing why I go into, Trademarks, they, they kind of fare to over into this, okay? Sometimes you can't trademark the title of a song, okay? But sometimes if you have an ingenious line somewhere in there that's very creative, we can work around getting you a trademark for that, you know? Just, you know? It's because um, you want to be able to exploit it. Use it for merchandising, things of that nature, okay? So there's where there's um, social, um, social media monetization 
where you're putting your things up for so many likes. You, I think, uh, with is it YouTube? It's 10,000 views or I don't know. It's something like that. You get who? Somebody new? Somebody said. To, okay, yeah. If you get a certain number of views, you start. You can get. You can make money off of it. You can ads ads on these things where you're making so many uh, views. Um, I had a list because it's a lot. Um, mechanical royalties, mechanical royalties, being able, again, allowing someone else to use your music and you get paid for it. Don't cheapen yourself. Um, I had a client come to me, someone wanted to use his catalog, um, some videos and videos, it was videos that he had and for a television show and they came to him with this nominal no number and he was like, yeah, I think that's cool. I'm like, what? No, it's not. Like, they want your material. They want you. He, we have to assign a value to that. There is a value to everything that you do. And so when some comes, someone comes to you and say, hey, I love this video you did. I love this song you did. I want to use it in whatever form. So many of you guys are like, okay, just to get on. That's not cool. Just to get on. You work hard to get on. So you say, okay, well, great. I'll have you talk to my lawyer, and we can negotiate a deal. For you to use, for you to have a license to use my music, um, a lot of them will try to do it in perpetuity, and that's just another whole thing. In perpetuity is for life. I'm gonna do life. Um, <laughs> yeah, we don't want to give anybody anything. We don't want to give First anything. Though, so, can I chime in on while you look, I'm sorry. I want to chime in on McKenna. Please, okay, yes, please. Go ahead, James. Um, and I hope y'all don't mind. I'm streaming y'all live so everybody can see this. So when she said mechanical license, that's very important for you guys to understand. A record goes platinum. Anybody know what that means when it goes platinum? So how many copies? A million copies. So I wrote one song in there called I Love This World, right? Under mechanical license and the copyright, like Professor Ashburn alluded to, I get nine cents for every copy of that CD that's sold. And that's just one license. I do dozens of other licenses. Now you may say, well, James, that's only nine cents. Well, when a record goes platinum, nine cents is $90,000. When a record goes multi-platinum, I'm getting 90,000 for every million sold. So if a record sells five million copies, I'm making $450,000. So if you don't write nothing else down today, please write down nine cents under the copyright law, 0.91 to be exact, so it would be 91,000, but we just round it and say 90. Now why is that significant? When Michael Jackson wrote Thriller, when Thriller sold 40 million copies, 50 million copies, 100 million, whatever it was, if you got one song on Thriller, like Quincy Jones had a couple of them, and you got nine cents for every million, and it's at 50 million copies sold. Is everybody with me? That's 50 times $90,000 well, for one song. Right. So when we talk about copyright, we're talking about that nine cents. Now what a record mm -hmm. label will do is they will say, we want to get the song at three quarters stat. And what they mean by three quarters is just that 75% of nine cents, so they wanna pay you six cents. Then they wanna sign you to a publishing deal and take half the six cents, or some portion of it. So you have to understand how those pennies are being divided up mm -hmm. when you're giving away points and half the song and two thirds of the song, you're cutting into that 90,000. Mm -hmm. and, and it can go quickly. You have certain lawyers, all we do all day is administer licenses, because we understand that nine cents is out there. When I call Sony, I'll say, has every song been licensed on that album? We can't find artist Heather Jones, James. She wrote the hit for Chris Brown, but we can't find her. I say, oh, we'll find her. And we call her up and we say, we got a, a check waiting for you. Would you mind if we do the paperwork? And she gets that nine cents times three million copies sold. So that's what she's talking about when she says a mechanical license. The contract is a two-page agreement. And we call it mechanical because back in the day, music was made with the big mechanical machine and all that stuff. So we call it mechanical, if I'm correct, Professor. Mm -hmm. I'll yield to you. But my mentor, Bill Kraslowski, an old Jewish guy back in New York, 90 years old, taught me. He wrote a book called The Business of Music, if you can get your hands on it. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I just wanted to chime that no, in. No, thank you. Recap. So James and Ursula and Professor and Omara, they have all sort of been telling you, OK, you're a business. You know you're in the business of what? Exploiting copyrights. And in that business, that means there's money to be made. In order to know how much money you're getting made, you need to know what part of that copyright you own. 
And you can't just know in your head, you better have it agreed to somewhere in writing or everyone will hold up all your money. Can't tell you how many hits I have on the radio right now. Everybody's happy, their families is happy, their Instagram is blowing up, their followers are multiplying. But guess what? They sitting back going, I still can't get paid. And everybody's already asking for loans. They don't have any of that money yet. So you now know what your split is, which means you know what? What percentage of that dollar? In James's example, this one, one source of income, because I need this to be clear with all of you. James just focused you in on mechanical licenses, which is the mechanical reproduction of a record. So CDs and back in the day cassettes and all that good stuff. Whenever some, a download counts. Anytime you sell that song, whoever the writers are, they've got this nine cent and it's a pool of money. Because remember, we're talking about the splits, and I asked you before, if you know what percentage of the song you own, you know what percentage of what? The money. So that nine cents, if it's 20 of y'all, <laughs> Wu-Tang style. Or if you're on Chris Brown's yes. album where there's 40 the clients, yeah, I can't. songs. The clients that we have. Oh yeah, let's not talk about Chris Brown's last album. All the clients on the Biggie albums. albums. Look at any Biggie song, they're like 20 <laughs> right. writers. Right. The whole so, Hitman crew. So the more writers, the more of you are sharing that nine cents in this one stream of income. But you understand that, and now you're understanding, oh, that's where I get my money, that's the part I get of it. Now, you multiply it times all of those sales, but just like Ursula was telling you, there's a bunch of other places you make money from this copyright thing. Because you can make money, she said, from licensing. Omara was telling you about all the TV shows she represents people on. There's music on those TV shows. Somebody has to license. Every time you hear license, this used to mess with me when I first became a lawyer. I was just like, I can't, I don't, I, it's Greek. What does that word mean? I don't, it was like one of those things sometimes you just can't grasp. It's a permission slip, okay? A permission slip. I own it, you want to use it, you need a permission slip from me to let you use it. And by the way, my permission slip requires you pay a fee, okay? So there's licenses, there's permission slips for TV, for records, for film. There's for licenses for gaming. For, for and gaming. gaming is huge. Y'all need to huge. look at that. It's huge. Yeah. Film and TV, James told you about the nine cents on a record. Well, have the opening credit song to the Spider-Man movie like my producer does. That's a check that doesn't have a law. Didn't say how much they have to pay for that. Which means we get to look at what is the budget for Spider-Man? We get to negotiate a rate. Those are six-figure checks just for the first permission slip for it to be in the beginning or end credits. My father-in-law has this little song at the end credits of a Beyonce documentary that came out this year. We were so happy as a family that she decided that she would not just have her music on the documentary but, and her record, but include his. She redid this Before I Let Go song, put it in the documentary. That means there's a check there. There's a check on the record. There's a check, she talked about PROs, performance rights. That's the radio. That's Sirius XM, that's Pandora, sound exchange. I, there's so many places that you make money and that's the point they're all making is that it's not just the, that mechanical license, that 90,000, that's one place. So when you hear people say the money is in publishing or the money is in, they're saying the money is in the business of the songs that you're writing and composing. Because really all these things we're talking about are at you as the songwriter, or sometimes the producer who's a songwriter. So that we, if you're the artist too, well, you go get your money. I also just want to mention metadata. If you don't understand metadata, which I wanted Brian Calhoun to chime in on since he used to work at Sound Exchange, but he just yeah. walked out. Oh, did he just leave? Yes, he did. Shoot. I'm so mad. I almost like yelled to him, but. Back. Um, Tell them what question to ask him later because anyway, he'll be back. <laughs> the point is, is that you, when Sound Exchange is doing, you're processing your money, they are looking at metadata. So there are many metadata issues. It's the underlining digital coding for each of the songs. So I, one of my best friends works at Sound Exchange and she's always talking about how, see this song right here, we're listening to on the radio, there's gonna be a metadata issue because of the, the similar song title or the similar producer name or the, the name or it's a producer and another producer but the other producer's name is similar to someone else that's already registered with Sound Exchange. Change. So a lot of times you need to make sure that you know everything has been registered property and everything is coding correctly so that your money isn't in 58 different places and you're trying to figure out well, I know I got more plays than this. Yeah, somebody else is getting a piece of your money who owns a song that actually is not even that popular. 
So. He's raising his hand back there. Somebody's raising their hand. Yeah. Just, we'll go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Open go ahead. The door. Yes. You may. You and I do up. need someone, if someone could let me know what my hard stop time is so I can oh, I manage the rest of my time. Hmm? I thought that he was with the conference. I'm sorry. <laughs> like it's telling okay. us to wrap it up. Oh, I thought you were oh, telling no. us to wrap no. it up. Uh-uh. <laughs> I had a question. How y'all doing? I'm Rockstar Pega. You're who? What's your name? Rockstar Pega. Okay. The brand, the image, the sound. Okay. The question is, with all that great registration, does it mean anything if you're not popping? Because it's like, okay, let me do all this administrative shit, but ain't nobody checking for me. So like, for me, I get what you're saying, but it's like, it's only important if people are searching for you. No, that's not true, Absolutely sir. Not. Not I, true. We are all about to just. Yeah. Can, can, I, I, mean, can I respond? Can I respond? Rockstar, I mean, you might want to back up. Just this is Atlanta. Bit. Hey, this is Atlanta. <laughs> the talent is everywhere, right? So you got people who's doing this administrative process split. No, sheets, we understand the points. question. We're real sharp. Well, we can I say this? If you, <laughs> let, let me say this. So you don't register your stuff. That was your burning question. For you and That's nobody no. pop it. Wait, no, okay. no, no. Let me put, explain. Put, put nobody check for you and nobody pop it. Put the, put the mic okay. back. Okay. Right, see. So, so you can, so you can listen coming. to the answers. Okay, okay. so I'm going to answer it. So you're saying, what if you don't register because you're not popping and nobody's checking for you? Okay, fine. So you write the song and somebody comes across that song, okay? And they take that song and say, oh, I like this. Let me tweak it here, do this. And it sells that 40 million. Got you. I you just you. missed out, bro. Me, I mean, then you I could go you. fight it and say, you're that's right. my song. Right. But now it's going to cost you money to fight it. you right. Even hard. You know what I'm saying? And where you could have just owned the rights. They liked it. You said, OK, let's work this out. We can we can jump on. You can license. There you go. True. So yes, there you, you. yes. Who you got me hot. Me, I'm about to stand up. Thing. I got to stand Real up. Real rock star shit. <laughs> I'm going to stand up like the professor. Let me tell you what we do. And a lot of this stuff you don't get paid retroactively on. Let, let me tell you what we do at, at my firm and at all of these people's firms. We prepare for success, okay? I don't need the client to come to me. Like, don't call me, not you personally, right? Generally, don't call me if what you're preparing for is maybe nobody's gonna be checking for me. Is that a reality? Sure. Right. Do you need to prepare for that? Absolutely. Right. Right. Absolutely. So, Everybody can win, everybody can right. come. Right. How and so ever, sir. I told you about this kid that is enjoying some really big success right now with some, some of the biggest hip hop records that have ever, not just last year, have ever been made. Okay. This is a kid I've been with for 17 years. Came up to me after a panel like this at a conference, excuse me, I would like to ask you some questions. Okay. To James's point earlier, he said, well, what's that gonna cost? I said, I think at the time, consultation fees, consultation. $100. It was a long time ago. Okay, I see. Long, long, long time. time. Oh, yeah. Okay, prices went up. I got you. He looked at me with that you. look James told you about that we get hundred dollars. I looked oh, down. Sure. I said, "Those are really nice sneakers. I always do it." <laughs> you paid for those. He took whatever time he needed. Came up with that hundred dollars. Probably got about ten thousand dollars worth of my time because he was eager to ask me questions. He was making beats in his basement, $50, free, whatever, okay? 17 years later, not yesterday, right. not the next day, right. check the, how many likes he had, yeah. who's checking for him. Right. 17 years later, and it hasn't taken that long to make any money, right. but the checks coming in right now and the conversations I have with him, it's like talking to one of them. He knows his business. I'm getting texts as we sit up here. Where are we at with? Is the contract signed? Did they sign that Swiss sheet? What did Kevin Gates say? What did 2 Chase say? What did Jay-Z say? What did Eminem say? What did everybody say? Okay? okay? So we plan for success. To your point, yes, it's an investment. Right. But you don't know if you look good today, is anybody, is any chick gonna be checking for you? Right? Right. right. But you get ready every day and you look good, don't you? He look like a thousand dollars. If you stay ready, you ain't gotta get ready. I got That's you. That's my favorite you. phrase. Next question, Thank next you. question. Come up to the mic with your questions, please. I don't know how much time we got, so. 
Yeah, I'm I'm said line up at the mic. Me yet, Good morning, everybody. My name is Neek during the day, Neek at night. I'm the assistant program director at uh, WHXT WWDM in Columbia, South Carolina. I know you guys were talking about copyright as well as trademark. And can you go ahead and explain the difference between the two? Because I understand with copyright, it has to do with a body of work or the artistry. But then trademark is a brand or a logo. So can you, somebody could just break that down. You kind of did, but good. You just did it. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, but, That's it. Pro professor. Copyright, you're talking about creative things like choreography, scripts, music. Trademark, you're talking more like brands. You're talking um, logos. Taglines. Services. Tag lines, services. Right? Services. So both are necessary. One really doesn't overlap into the other. They're both necessary because now, as you know, we don't sell music now. We sell brands. And they're both a part of something in the law we call intellectual property. You might have heard that phrase, intellectual property. What that really means is it's something you own, property, but it comes from creativity, it comes from your mind, it comes from kind of this intellectual space. So if we're talking about music, we're talking about the copyright, if we're talking about choreography and all of these other categories of creative things, writing books, poetry, those things, we're talking about the copyright. If, on the other hand, we are talking about branding, we're talking about a logo, the, or we're talking about the Nike swoosh, or the McDonald arches, or the Just Do It slogan, uh, those types of things. That's what's trademark law. That's all about, hey, I came up with this name, I came up with this logo, I came up with this phrase that I'm associating with my product or my service, right? It's my stage name, maybe, right? Or it's my logo to my clothing line. That is a trademark. It's a whole different area of law. It's a whole nother process. Um, it requires, excuse me, it requires registration, just like copyrights, to be protected. You gotta put people on notice, y'all, if you really expect to own something. They've gotta know you own it, otherwise how do they know not to take it, right? And all of this stuff is like, it's just as valuable, this intellectual property stuff, as if you are playing Monopoly and buying up a bunch of houses. Because each piece of intellectual property you own is like owning a house. And just like these splits and things we're talking about, imagine you hired contractors to build you a house. And somebody came in and put the plumbing in, someone laid the floor, someone did the roof. And at the end of it all, they were like, your gardener and your, and your carpenter said, I'll take the master bedroom. And then your painter said, I can't wait to move in that basement. And everybody started to say, that's mine. You'd be like, wait, what just happened? So the rules, when you hire those kind of contractors, they sign something that says, I'm coming in, I'm gonna paint, and then goodbye. They can't own it with you. But in intellectual property, you get all those people to help contribute. If you don't have your stuff in writing, Mr. I've spent all this money getting my paperwork together. If you don't have it in writing, they can, guess what? They actually get to move in with you. So there's actually a difference that's even more dangerous to you if your business of your intellectual property is not in order. And try to separate things into columns. You know, I like to be very um, succinct and break it down very simple. I know it's a lot of information. It just probably is like a cloud, a blurry cloud coming at you of just stuff. But really think about breaking it down into who you are. I am a writer. What streams of income are standard for writers? I am a producer. What streams of income are standard for producers? So I only say that to make a point about Sound Exchange. Not only the artist and the master rights owner in Sound Exchange is going to make money. In the hip hop industry, a lot of artists are transferring a percentage of their Sound Exchange money in every single producer agreement over to that producer. Now, that's not necessarily standard internationally, but with hip hop, it is very standard in America, where if I had a client come to me who wrote some of the biggest Beyonce records ever and say to me, I went to Sound Exchange and they don't have a record of any of my songs and you got five to 10 to 15 amazing songs over the last 20 years that you've done and the attorney never got counter signatures on a single letter of direction. So that means that none of them were processed None of them, and, and that entire time that money has been flowing through without your LOD attached. They will attach it but they're not gonna go back and pay you for the last 15 years, 10 years that you missed. And Brian, you just came back in, you walked out Look when I was trying timing. to Come on. get you for <laughs> metadata to say a couple of things about metadata and its importance or just sound exchange. Um, well, before he does that, that young man's been waiting a while to answer this question, mm -hmm. out of respect for him. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jay Rose, I'm an artist and also an independent label head. And I just wanted to know, uh, 
so I have an artist um, signed who's from South Africa and is based in South Africa. And I wanted to know if I have to familiarize myself with the copyright law there um, instead of America, even if I'm going to be prioritizing an American market with her music. Are they a member of the Berne Convention? That's what the Berne Convention is. <laughs> you know, are, that's the there's some treaties. <laughs> One of them is called um, the Berne Convention. Um, and most countries are a member of the Berne Convention. And if that's the case, then the Copyright Act would apply pretty much to all of those countries. But I'm not familiar with whether or not South Africa is. Uh, I have a partner that does business here. I'll give you my card, and we can help you this week. Find Thank out. you very much. Yeah. And in Africa, it's very difficult, which they're going to have to figure it out real soon, because Africa kind of got next, right? All that kind of Afropop, and a lot of that is just it's becoming so huge worldwide. But there are a lot of countries in Africa that there is absolutely no copyright law at all. There's no process, there's no anything. Um, and so it gets more complicated if you're originating your music there. Yes. Um, but the thing is, is that you can still contractually adopt the terms of how you want to be paid, of how you want to conform to certain things according to like US uh, law, et cetera. But, if you are starting there, and I don't know South Africa in particular, but I have clients from Zimbabwe and a lot of other African countries who are writers, producers, doing music there, come here. A lot of them are signing publishing deals here or admin deals here so they can kind of have a company handle that business for them worldwide. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Hello. I'm too tall for this. All right, um, <laughs> my question is, um, say you were to be the producer, lyric writer, basically you created the entire composition from the first note till it is a master. If you were using samples, like I use samples from Splice, now there's a separate contract associated with Splice mm -hmm. entirely, but when I'm doing my split sheets, would I still have 100% if I did it all because I'm still using these Splice samples or would I have to include them in some Let me answer for you an example. When, when you listen to Bad Boy Records and they sample a lot of music, they go to Barry Gordy, they get his permission. They go to Herb Albert and they get his permission for Hypnotize. Herb Albert owns, I think, the majority of that song that Biggie did, if not all of it. So you can put down what you want, but if you take in my music, if I understand your question, I can come in and say, no, you don't own it all. I, I'm more referencing uh, like instrumental samples rather than like a clip from someone else's song. Right, but is the instrumental mm -hmm. yours or somebody else's instrumental? Because Biggie took Hypnotize, he just took the bass line. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? Yeah, so here, here's, here's what happens when you have the copyright. The first one, it's theirs. I think it might have been either Ursula or Omar earlier who were saying that, you know, r when you're the first one, before you add all the other people who add their parts, you have a copyright. Mm -hmm. So that music that you're hearing and putting into yours, someone else owned it before you. And here's what gets kind of weird about that. People will be like, oh, I just put a sample in. It's just a part of it. So, I mean, I get they might own some of it or I might have to give them some, but not all. It's actually not how the law works. I have it first, so I control the permission slips. Okay. So you can add it, thank you, that was lovely. Now you have to come ask me, from what I just did, how much of that do you still wanna keep? Think about that, still wanna keep, why? Because they were first, it was theirs. If they say, yeah, 100%. It's theirs. Okay. It's happened. Luther Vandross samples have happened. Uh, Rolling Stones samples. People, rock bands. Huge people have covered these records. Not covered. Excuse me. Sampled these records. Used little bits, and the original people have kept 100 percent. The entire. Now Heather, in hip hop, it usually is a little more Heather, deferential, and we, you know, share. But Heather, you don't have you, to. I think and if you that, wanna, if that party has already registered and they've done what they were supposed to, that first person, once you put it up for monetization and upload it. It's gonna tag them. They're gonna catch on. For you and in the whole call. room, for you in the whole room, what we're talking about is a derivative work. I write a song, it's already out there, human nature. Then you add a new paragraph to it or a new verse to it, mm -hmm. you're taking a derivative of my copyright, so I, I still own it. It's not an original work. As a copyright is supposed to be original, it's not original. You might put an original verse in it, yeah. but it's still my song, human nature. You just wrote the fifth verse to it. What I'm more referencing is like, for I example, think like I understand. Eight oh eight clip, right? So let me say something. Which clip? Right. Let me say. Which clip? Eight oh eight. Eight oh eight clip. 
um, from Splice, which I paid Eight. for, and according to the contract, okay. yeah. I... Oh, and actually, like, actually, you know what? He brings up a really good point, because I do. I rep a lot of producers, and a lot of times, and this is important for any of you who are producers, there's a lot of websites that'll say you can come and you can get these music clips. What he's talking about, and we apologize, but it was still important. Yes. Said, so go with it. Um, but he's saying, I take a little music clip from one of these sites. I've signed a contract with the site. They say I can use it. Every single site's contract is different. It's I different. have had people Thank come you. and it'll look like it says, you can use it, you can put it out. Sometimes they'll limit how many copies you can make of it. That's Sometimes right. they'll limit uh, whether or not it can be uh, only streamed or you can actually make, you know, have it for download. Sometimes it will actually say you can't do it at all and it'll look like it kinda is giving you permission and or it's it not. A and a lot of times, all, a lot of different producers are contributing to those music beds. Here's some drum beats, here's some guitar, here's, you know, like you're saying. And sometimes each different person who's contributed their music may have a different set of rules. I have had clients with singles out. Record is out. They paid their promo person, their manager, they put the cute outfit on, they did the video. It's done, it's out. And then they get this weird call and they get a takedown notice like they were mentioning. And they're like, why isn't it up? because sometimes you've gone beyond the scope of what that contract was. So some sites, yes, you can use it, for, but you really gotta be careful. And go through those agreements. Mm -hmm. So you, I agree, you really need to print it out and yeah. look at it. Next question. Yes, and, yeah, because we're telling us we have to wrap, so we're just gonna, if it's okay, we'll take this last question, and then we'll wrap up. Thank you. First, I wanna say good morning. How y'all doing? Um, I'm Young A, I'm an artist, and I'm also signed Rec 33. And I just have a general question. I don't know if it's off topic, but what would be the process to go through if I wanted to create my own record label to make sure everybody is happy with the profits and all, and all that stuff? Call one of us. <laughs> I mean, Call I, us. first I wanna, what did you say your name was? That's the short Young of it. Ed. Young Ed? Yeah. I wanted to thank Young Ed. You handed this out for me, thank you. No um, when you get home, you read it, and you'll see all of the things on here. Okay. Copyright, trademark, your agreement with producers, recording contracts, so on. Mm -hmm. Skip down to nine where it says setting up the corporation. What I see sometimes is producers want to share with the artists, so they'll say, we're going to set up a label together. Okay. And that's very complicated because the artist wants to own a piece of it. You're going to own it as a producer. It gets a little crazy. Okay. So if you want to do that, I think you get with a good lawyer mm -hmm. and let, like she said earlier, let them help you navigate it so it makes sense. Should you be an LLC? Should you be a production company? Should you be a corporation? Should the artist be signed to you in a JV, joint venture? Or are you gonna sign them just as a regular artist deal? You gotta go through all of those kind of mechanics to decide what's the best structure. Are you gonna own some of their publishing? Is it gonna be a 360 deal where you get a piece of everything? But I think you're doing the right thing mm -hmm. by making these things, questioning them now, because what usually happens is that somebody goes ahead and puts out a record and then they realize that nobody took the time to set up the company, nobody took the time to get EIN numbers, ISRC, I mean, these, so what you're doing is right, but 